Gentlemen, you are both drunk on cosmic wine. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Mark Sylvester. And I'm Dr. Richard Schulman. This, this is All Psych. Welcome to the show. Wait, I have to consent to be recorded here. There we go. Are you serious? It said it was a big sign. Why do they keep developing You must consent to be recorded. Do they know much? I pay for the... Oh, wait. We don't pay. <laughs> Actually, we do pay for this software. Somebody pays. Yeah. So we have a very special guest today. I'm super excited about it. I know you're excited about it, Dr. Shulman. Um... I mean, I think we should just get right into it. There's a lot of content. I cannot believe we haven't done a topic on trauma. So Dr. Shulman and I, mostly me, let's be honest, sought out the best trauma psychologist, therapist that we could find. And again, I did the legwork. Um, well, you hire, input. you hire the, you know, you hire the guests. Yeah, he, he, he had some input, but I just ignored it. I'm glad um, to hear that. Because our special guest today is uh, that guy. Ooh, that's me. Dr. Richard Shulman with the beard right over there. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an honor to be a guest on my own show. Yeah, it's, you know, I always said like the, 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 on uh, the Tonight Show, the guest host. What was the, the guest host? Is that like, you know, sort of jumbo shrimp or military intelligence or mental health Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. You know, I feel like we're doing a whole show of a mental mental wealth tip tonight. Yeah, so Actually, let's skip today, it. It's, it's a day. Let's skip it and learn all about, our topic is the trauma map. Well, this, and... this, whole, this whole concept started when I was working with a patient who had some very, very severe traumatic experiences. And he said to me, you know, you like a trauma map. I said, yeah, that's a really good idea. So in my uh, experience, you know, dealing with addictions, dealing with serious uh, behavioral mental problems, it's all about trauma, I think. And, and, and I dove in deeply uh, to know everything I could about trauma. And I have, I was talking with another uh, therapist uh, yesterday evening who really is, is terrific at this. And, and she said, well, you're like a trauma street fighter. You get in and you, know, and you do the battle. So let's, let's define some terms. I was gonna say, I don't even know what trauma is. Tell me, how, what is trauma? How do I know if I've had it? What does it look like? And then what can I do about it? That's pretty much our whole show. What do you want to do in the, the last, you know, 55 minutes? Trauma is from the Greek word. It literally means wound. And it basically it's an internal response to a deeply disturbing or distressing event. And it will overwhelm an individual's ability to cope. It causes feelings of helplessness, uh, diminishes your sense of self. And you get a full range of emotions and experiences. Um, according to the American Psychological Association, it's an emotional, I'll read, it's an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. It's funny how they don't include war in that, but okay. I'll oh, there's a lot that's not included. You can get uh, yeah. traumatized uh, by a grenade that you think is active that's really not. Well, yeah, because a lot of it is what you believe about the event and, and what your um, experience is. I mean, my, one of my favorite um, examples that I give people is if you come in a room and the light is low and there's something coiled under the chair, you think it's a snake, you get upset, you turn on the light, it's a rope. Well, it was always a rope. So a lot of it is, is what people... Uh, put on the event. On the other hand, there are, there are some events that are kind of hard to ignore. If you're in a plane crash, let's say, and you obviously if you survive it, that's a catastrophe. You could be in a, a soldier and have um, a battle every four or five days, and then you will rest in between, or you could 
you know, live in a tough part of, of a big city and experience, you know, some kind of horrific thing every few days. Or you could be in, a, in an alcoholic family, let's say, where stuff is happening every day, but it doesn't reach the level of catastrophe. To me, that's all trauma because it's how you experience it. And basically you experience a loss of control. That's the hallmark of it. You're in that plane that's crashing in, you're not exactly gonna be able to control it. I probably learned more about uh, post-traumatic stress and that's how you get to trauma in, <coughs> in my world is by um, talking to people who've been through it. <laughs> you did get something to drink, good for you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, excellent. You know, and when I, when I worked in the VA, um, the men that I spoke with who were the real guys, there were guys that were telling stories. It was before the internet, back in the old days before they changed the air and the water, you know. Um, and I even called the Department of Defense once to see if this guy's story was real because the guys who were really in combat, they didn't want to talk about it. And when they did talk about it, they got worse. That was the key. Because um, when we talk about trauma, we talk about you know post-traumatic stress, that's what we deal with for the most part. <coughs> um, now there's there's a difference between acute trauma and post trauma and you know and sort of a post-traumatic stress kind of situation. If you're in a car wreck and it's a bad one, you're gonna be upset. You may feel nervous getting into a car week 10 days go by you're fine or you're allowed to uh, uh, allowed uh in the dsm they give you up to 30 days okay to to recover trauma from trauma like symptoms and they're pretty acute trauma like symptoms but yeah. you know they got to pick a number 30 days is what's on the book yeah i find if you get to 30 days you're probably going to get to 31. <laughs> so usually to yeah. me it, it passes a little faster but you know, there, there'll be chronic kinds of trauma. You can get this from in domestic violence and bullying, child abuse. Repetitive. Repetitive kind abuse. of stuff. Yes. And then there's something called complex trauma where you have a number of different traumas that seem to go on top of each other. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's something that you and I kind of both experience, <coughs> which is secondary trauma. It's like secondhand smoke. Mm -hmm through these situations with people and you're going to be affected by them it, there's just no way around it and that's why we kind of have to process so you know what where i was really introduced as i said was the va and there was one case that really um just got me crazy it was a it was the nightmare case and i was green as a piece of broccoli at the time i i didn't know really what was going on and to make matters worse, I was being supervised by sort of the top guy in Northern California at the time. And the nightmare case, 350 pounds, uh, COPD, panic attacks, addicted to pain meds. This guy comes in, what do you ask a vet, especially if you don't know what you're doing? Well, did you see combat? This guy starts to unspool. Yeah, he was a medic, he had seen everything. And he had never really talked about it before and why he picked me, I don't know, but he starts to unspool and I was dumb, but I wasn't that dumb. I, I, you got to slow down, man, you're going to blow up. So no, he wasn't doing that. First session, second session, third session, fourth session, he's in the hallway of the clinic screaming at the top of his lungs that I ruined his life. So, you know, I'm from New York. Uh, that part didn't bother me that much. I, I went out and I said, hey, listen, buddy, you want to yell at me? Come on in here. You're disturbing the rest of the clinic. No, he, want, he wants everyone to know. I couldn't get the guy to shut up. So I went over to, uh, to my uh, supervisor's office, which was in the next building. And I said, can you get Dr. Sikowski for me? And she said, he's in with somebody. I said, just get him. <laughs> I guess she took me seriously. You got to visualize this guy. Bright red hair, completely bald over here. Big smile, what's going on? I said, you know, that patient of ours, you're gonna find out a little bit, I don't know, maybe from a couple hundred people that 
he's uh, screaming in the uh, hallway of the clinic and I can't get him to shut up. I figured I'd, I'd tell you rather than you hear from somebody else. Well, I, I could go through the whole story, but basically he, uh, he takes me, he, get, he takes me and we wind up driving to a place, I thought it was somebody's house. It was a restaurant. His buddy was a, had a Chinese restaurant out of a house and he begins to feed me. And he says, you know, if you ever think you're really terrific, remember this day and stay humble. Proceeds to tell me about when he was humbled by a patient when he was a young therapist. Then he gets to the punchline. You're a young man, you're gonna be very good at this. Maybe you lost some confidence today. Remember, you're gonna be good at this. Remember where you get to where I am, where I have no confidence in our profession. I knew what he meant. It was because the guys who really needed the help, you tried to help them, they got worse. And I went on a mission at that point to find a better way. You know, I tried everything. To, with various degrees of success, psychodrama, holotropic breath work, uh, regression hypnosis. And I hit upon this mind body stuff that really changed the game for me. It, it was, uh, I worked at a chronic pain management unit and the, um, the physical therapist had uh, been trained by the Upledger Institute. And I started doing this and the results were beyond anything I had ever seen for chronic pain. Now chronic pain, like addiction, is almost invariably rooted in some kind of emotional suffering. Well, how does a patient or a potential patient watching this know they have trauma? Well, well we kind of define trauma, right? A little bit, but that's requiring them to make an extra step or leap. Like, what does trauma look like in a patient? How, how do, uh, I have a feeling a lot of people are going to say, do I have trauma? I want to be able to answer that question or give them the tools to realize like, yeah, maybe you have trauma that needs to be looked at by a professional. What do they look for? Well, it's number one, it's not, it's not a black and white kind of thing. And really what we're looking for is the internal reaction. So let's say you, you, you know, every look, 60% of the population, according to some study, I, I, I have the figure here somewhere, uh, will have been through a trauma, a car wreck, domestic violence, um, war, sexual mistreatment, and there's a whole list, okay? The question really is how do you react to anything that either symbolizes or resembles the, the original event? Mm. So if you're reacting with anxiety, flashbacks, nightmares, memories you can't get rid of, consider that you need to work on it. If it's disrupting your uh, relationships, if it's, if it's causing avoidance behavior, substance- Preventing you from doing certain activities that you, you used to like to do and now you don't. Exactly. Or you just now, avoid all, all together, right? Well, you'll, you know, that's right. You, you avoid, you know, and-, and Usually what will happen is um, the risk factors for, for post-traumatic stress are previous trauma, <laughs> you know, a physical injury, or uh, you, had, you didn't have any support during or right after the trauma, or uh, there were other stressors at that time. I, I used to run, I called it the multiple hit. If I you had it referred to as stacking. So the you know an early childhood trauma uh is is encoded which we're going to talk about and then maybe another trauma happens five ten years down the road and then it gets stacked or reactivates but it's still a stacking triggers off the first trauma and that was one isn't that one possible theory as to why some vets got ptsd during war combat and others didn't because maybe the ones that did among other variables that I'm sure you'll talk about, had a previous trauma to kind of sensitize them for the, for the biggie. I believe that. And in fact, one of the uh, very specific story was a, a, a man that I worked with who had been in a, one of those roadside bombings in Afghanistan and he lost a number. <laughs> 
I keep having this hallucination that an old psych cup is there's something wrong with bringing it. me nectar. Um, it looks big. You know, anyway, that he had um, he'd been in one of these roadside bombings, we, and it was very horrific. He lost a number of people he was close to. He saw it happening. He couldn't stop it. Going through the re the release was incredibly profound for me. The energy of the explosion was almost as if he was holding it. The guy didn't get a dot better. Uh, what is until, a release? Excuse me. What is a release? Well, when he had the emotional re-experiencing the event with emotional, uh, with the emotion that you would expect to have the horror, the the grief, the sorrow, the, the all the the different emotions that came up in that moment, um, the helplessness. Now that was the key. And that, but that occurred in a ther in your office in a therapeutic. Yes, yes. he didn't experience that when it was happening. It was it happened too fast, but it had been in, all encoded. And then he was doing some pretty, pretty crazy stuff. He was searching out um, malls for bombs. He it was he was it was not able to work anyway. He didn't get any better till we till we worked on a childhood trauma where his father had. Uh, thrown him through a, a plate glass window in a drunken rage. Then he started getting better. So the stacking idea, you know, is it's valid in my experience. So and we, we always have to look for it. It's almost like you can go in and determine where the sensitization process began. I mean, essentially, you're looking for a psychic pressure point as <laughs> as the as the origin, as the as the um, emotional event that set the ball in motion, and you're going to get much better results if you start at the. Do you always get better results if you start at the beginning and you identify the earliest trauma, or if there's some later trauma that's so much more ingrained, you actually get better that results starting there, or you end up having to go deal with both separately. Yes, <laughs> the, the reason I say that is because I always start where the person is willing to talk to me. I mean, it's, it's their life, it's their experience. Uh, I often will say, okay, anything sound like this earlier in your life? Anything, because I'll do a trauma history for sure. And, you know, under those circumstances, you're gonna find it, but people may not be comfortable talking about the, the the early one, ah, you know, I know I did that. My father, I understand, you know, all that, whatever that is. Um, and then you have to find a way to get back to it. Some people go, yep, that's where it started. And they'll let you right in. It's, you know, it's their life. And each person is a little bit different in terms of their defenses and their model of the universe. You have to go with where the person is ready. On the other hand, there are certain indicators that you can find, I, I know I'm sounding like I'm, I'm lecturing a group of young therapists, maybe all of you out there are young therapists. No, I mean, we're just trying to understand from a per patient's perspective, how big of a deal trauma and post traumatic stress is, because there's so much mis mis uh, understanding and misperception, I think of what it is and what it is not. And more importantly, what the treatment is and what it's not, you know, because we've talked about not just your capacity, but any trauma therapist capacity to make you worse if they don't know what they're doing. And well, that's I think, you know, you, you know, every intervention has a risk and a reward and hopefully the risk is low and the reward is high, but with anything else, you have to know what you're doing. The bottom line is that trauma that happens when you're a child is almost undoubtedly uh, far worse because kids are vulnerable. The brain develops as it develops and it's not fully developed. Some people say till age 29. I don't know, I'm 68. I'm still wondering when it finishes. Um, children will experience a heightened state of stress during traumatic events, uh, during a, a car crash or even uh, someone coming home drunk and acting like a jerk. Um, well, how do you define stress in that? Um, in that situation? Well, stress is an internal event. They came upon the, the term stress from, by the way, from uh, wind tunnel tests of wings during World War II. And it's where the wing buckled that they called the stress. 
stress is a feeling of anxiety, of, of sadness, of panic, of something internal. We think of stress outside of ourselves. We go back to that uh, example of the snake and the rope. How you perceive that situation determines how much internal reactivity you have. So we're talking about internal reactivity. Uh, you know, it's funny because usually you and I joke around a lot about, but this is not a jokeable topic. No, no, no. We, this is going to be a more the, serious. We see the the terror no. uh, that people live with, uh, the the physiological symptoms that they live with on a daily basis, the flashbacks, the nightmares, the startle responses, um, and. And if, you, if people review their own lives, they can probably come up with something. Most people can come up with something that they're uncomfortable with. Well, can I tell you something I'm embarrassed to admit that I know you know? Um, okay. I underestimated the pandemic's ability to reactivate dormant traumas, stable traumas, if that's a, a way to think of it. I was really, really uh, impressed and not a good way at how many people's traumas were reactivated through the stacked layer of trauma that coincidentally we're all going through. Is that what we were talking about earlier? That this is just no different. It's a new stressor. It's just one that coincidentally is happening to you and me and everyone in the country and everyone in the world. Well, I, I number one, you and everybody else discounted what this was going to do to to the entire, perhaps the entire world. Certainly, uh, our society. If you go back to the diagnostic criteria. It's that a person has witnessed something that is either threatening death or somebody died or it threatened their own lives, okay, in some way or threatened their sense of security, let's say. Yeah. I don't remember the exact wording, but... Horrific uh, is in there. Something, yeah. It's a horror. So if you go back, and, and my introduction to the, the um, pandemic was watching a basketball game and seeing the players walk off the court and so the announcing, well, one of the players tested positive for coronavirus, so they're canceling the game. And I had tickets for a hockey game two days later that I was anticipating, and then that game got canceled. And now we started to see this on television. The president is on TV with the head of the, the head doctor of the country, and, and they don't sound too happy. Now death counts are coming on on the, in the corner of, on, on the scroll, 7,000 people have died. We were inundated with this. We talk about the, the trauma that was happening every day, every hour. And you and I spoke about this. We even, uh, I, I did a few blog, video blogs about, well, the first thing you do is don't look at your TV mm -hmm. if you wanna get through this, but it didn't matter. You go into a store, there were signals all over the place. The masking, the social distancing, it was Might being- Might you call hammered. those triggers? Absolutely. When this is Absolutely. all over, are people gonna be triggered by surgical masks in the OR? I can't tell you about some people, but I can tell you there's gonna be kids who are afraid to breathe. Kids who are afraid they're gonna be infecting their friends and their relatives and are gonna be afraid of masks and um, because anything that symbolizes or reminds a person of the trauma will activate feelings. Now, why is that important? You know, in psychology, there are very few laws, mostly, the mostly theories. This is a law, the law of state dependent learning and memory. It's what I base a lot of my work on the psychophysiological state you're in when you learn something determines how you remember it and work with the memory. So let's say you're studying for an exam. You drink a lot of coffee to stay up all night to, to study. Drink some coffee before you take the exam. You'll remember it better. Because of state-dependent learning. State-dependent learning. So whatever. Now, under stress, 
people go into what look like trance states. When you're in a trance, you can be more easily influenced, more easily suggested. You scare some, why do people go into um, fright houses on Halloween? Because it activates a different psychophysiological state. Now it's funny because I always hated those things. And one day, one, one of the kids uh, that was with me said, can you take me in there? And I said, uh, I don't really like those things, but okay. I came out of there high. Literally, I, was, I, I, was, I felt high. And then that night I had a nightmare. <laughs> so go figure that, that whatever that was activated me both to get me in that psychophysiological state. And this is one of those real Hollywood ones with the real makeup. It didn't look hokey, it looked real. And I, I, I was shocked because I came out high. I said, oh, well, now I know why people do this because it gets them high. Um, but in the end, the nightmare that, that it activated in me was not particularly pleasant. What, what do you mean it gets them high? I felt like I was in a trance when I came out of there. You know, as, as if... Um, well, a trance and being high, I, I'm, I don't equate. Like high, you, you, like you got a buzz as if you had taken a drug high. Yeah, yeah. Or you were in a trance. Well, a little bit of both. I, all I could say is that I, I don't respond well to, uh, to substances. I, I'm sort of a, uh, a renegade um, and not by choice that my body is just programmed that way. Alcohol, you know, gives me a headache and marijuana makes me psycho. So I kind of tend to stay away from that. And, you know, any, anything I've taken, you know, that, you know, a Valium or anything just makes me loopy. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. But this was odd when, when I, for example, if I'm under acupuncture, I'll come out, I'll be buzzed like people describe being on a drug. This well, was that, like that. that may have something to do more with energetics. Is it possible the horror house, the haunted house, the spook house, I forgot what you called it, um, was enough. making you high off of your own adrenaline? It's very possible, yes. But I think, I think it was because I, it was as if I was in a trauma because I'm very sensitive to this stuff. That's why I don't watch horror movies, generally speaking, um, for whatever reason. Um, everything I've read and everything I've experienced says that during, all right, I'll give you an example. I was in a car wreck, uh, boy, it was a long time ago. It was right before uh, my son, my younger boy was born. And um, during the car wreck, it was as if I, I couldn't figure out why the windshield was coming so close to my face. And the seatbelt grabbed me, bring me, brought me back into, into ordinary time. I was experiencing a time distortion, I'm guessing due to the stress of the event of getting hit hard from behind and being thrown forward. Um, this is what people describe. They describe the trauma like they're in a, in a, in a state. A, a friend of mine was, um, a Vietnam vet, he was a, a Navy SEAL and he talked about being in a firefight and a couple of his friends died. And he said, yeah, I, I was just in La Laville and I walked up to the machine gun nest, dropped the hand grenade and walked away. They could have killed me at any point. I was just in another state. So I got, he said, I got the bronze star for being crazy, you know, but I don't think well, it was crazy. Kind of like what berserkers do, or, you know, we did a whole topic on that too. Um, what do you think are risk factors for people? Because some are modifiable and some are not modifiable, but what do you think are risk factors? Well, it's certainly pre any previous previous trauma for sure. Which you mentioned, um, yeah. Uh, other kinds of mental health or physical health conditions, um, a lack of support. So that's a modifiable one. Um, yes, yes. If someone comes back from what they perceive or someone else perceives as a trauma, they should certainly reach out to a, to a therapist that specializes in trauma and get professional support, although personal support would be nice as well, would be supportive and helpful as well, or not necessarily. It, yes, but the, here's the problem. 
Uh, I spoke with a, one of my patients today who today, not today, he told me today, but this week he reported that he had been uh, raped by a priest when he was eight years old. He actually reported it. And it was his response, he said, the, the guy at the other end said, uh, well, I'm glad to hear you're back at work because he was saying I was out of work. I was basically homeless, but I'm getting therapy now and um, I'm back to work. And the guy said, well, God bless you. He didn't think that was so great <laughs> considering, that activated him, yeah. you know, that it kind of activated him a little bit. I think that you have to have a special understanding, you know, uh, of the nature of the trauma and how to approach it. Well, it's over now, isn't it? Does, it's not gonna work. Um, you know, more of what do you need right now? Um, people, people's reactions are, and I, I'm using this word advisedly, are unconscious. They're not controlling it. There's circuitry that goes on with how the brain is encoding this information so they literally can't think about it. It happens before. My job is to, in some way of thinking, is to disrupt the circuitry that causes the emotional hijacking. So you, a person can say, yeah, I know that that's a rope, but it looks like a snake and I'm freaking out. They're not doing that on purpose, at least most part. In fact, there was one case, and I actually wrote about this one in my book, um, the guys, I got the, the chart, I was working at a pain management clinic and I got the chart and, the, and it said that the man was a Navy SEAL. Now I know, I don't say former Navy SEAL because there's, they're never former. They're always, they're once a Navy SEAL, you're always a Navy SEAL. And it said, we think this guy's a malingerer. I said, Navy SEAL, malingerer, do you ever meet a Navy SEAL? Psycho, maybe, malingerer, never. <laughs> so we had to figure out what was going on with this guy because he had chronic back pain, the docs couldn't explain it. He had slipped and fallen on his back at work and then he had terrible pain. As we uncovered this, he had been in a chopper with his back against, you know, you know how they sit in the chopper with their knees up and their back. And his, his CO said, run to the other chopper. I want you with the other group. As he's running, a missile comes in, kills his CO and all his buddies and he lands on his back. The landing on his back activated the memory. He had not dealt with this memory. The crazy thing, no, not crazy, maybe it's sane. I watched his back change shape, literally, as he was sobbing and really, really crying about all his friends who had died. Then he went into the, the secondary traumas of coming back to the United States and being called a baby killer and being spat on when he got off the plane. Um, these are the kinds of experiences, and he really got better, okay? So, so these are the kind of experiences that, that I've had that, that tell me, number one, how real the event is. This is the last guy in the universe who would have been a malingerer. And malingerer, for the others who don't know, is somebody who's faking it. Okay. They're consciously. Or yeah, they're consciously faking. They're not really hurt. They just don't feel like working. Or not this guy. Again, yeah. You know, and people need to. Okay, it's funny. You know, we we're we're as a country, we are absolutely obsessed with health and do almost nothing that's healthy. I don't know why we don't have a stress management card that psychiatrists and psychologists are signing off that you've done your stress management training. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to do it. So how you handle emotional events is gonna be a predictor of how you handle trauma. Are you reaching out to someone? Are you looking at, are you embracing it? Are you eating right? Are you exercising? Um, how have you responded to stress in the past? The other thing you asked me some of the, um, risk factors, sometimes the intensity of the event is worth noticing too. But it's all gonna boil down to how a person perceives it. Like I said before, most people in a plane crash are gonna to have to talk to somebody. Um, 
some of the symptoms, and I got a, a real long list, I don't wanna miss any. Denial, anger, fear, sadness, shame, big one, shame, confusion, anxiety, depression, numbness, guilt, hopelessness, irritability, difficulty concentrating, emotional outbursts, withdrawal, flashbacks, and nightmares are really what we're looking for. Well, Rich, how is that different from anybody else who comes and sees you? It's very different. It's very different yeah. because you have to get to that original circuitry somehow or the person spends their whole life sort of, in my words, white knuckling through life, just holding on. And lack of symptoms is not health. I want my people to have a robust experience of life. If you're living in trauma, you're not having a robust experience. You're living defensively. You're waiting for the other shoe, shoe to drop. And here's a, a symptom that does not make the diagnostic manual and maybe, maybe it should. My experience with people who have post-traumatic stress, and I hate to use the word disorder because it is actually a healthy response in a way so that people don't go crazy at the moment of the trauma. Mm -hmm. But if you have post-traumatic stress, what I've noticed is people don't think their lives are gonna work out. They don't think they're gonna have the relationships, <laughs> that always cracks me up, Mark. Maybe that's a symbol of something. Um, What's funny is there's nothing in this thing. You know? But my belief was that there was a really healthy glass of water in there or something. Anyway. Did I have you fooled? Here at the Alt Psych Show? You, I have you yes, fooled? yes of course, of course like you did. I, I totally believe what you say. Um, hypervigilance we were talking about well what we're talking about is that people don't believe they're going to have good relationships or a good career or be have good finances they're always they're not going to be loved they're not going to it's not um things are never going to work out so they create that within themselves the other thing is one of the things that i that i noticed um with soldiers is they think they um and maybe other people think this too, but I noticed it more with soldiers. There was a guy, he had every symptom of post-traumatic stress, every single one. And he said to me, you know, I'm not, it's not like I had my leg blown off or something. I said, your life would be easier if your leg was blown off. At least you could explain why you're such a mess. Yeah. You know, um, you're... Um, you, your relationships suck. You, you don't have a good relation with your kids. You can't work. He said, was a brilliant guy. You can't work. Probably a, a high risk of a, a alcohol problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, Absolutely. I alcohol and other substances as well. But you know, you, you and I both know as people who treat addiction that we're treating trauma. You know, I don't know if you're if you're a fan of Gabor Mate, Dr. Mate. I think that's how you pronounce it. Brilliant, brilliant guy. And he says addiction is born in human suffering. And and that's been my experience of it. Now this doesn't take addicts off the hook. They still have to get treatment. Okay. No, but it's, you know, it's the, the uh, your genes load the gun and your environment pulls the trigger. Right. I know. Yeah, well, and this is what we deal with all the time. So Thanks. here's the environment, bullying, harassment, bullying. A physical, psychological, sexual abuse, sexual assault. Or the threat of it. There you go. Can be um, enough. So we talked a lot about kind of like war and, and, and sexual trauma. Um, and I just wanna make clear that we see trauma, whether you call it PTSD or post-traumatic or adjustment, a trauma across all kinds of situations outside of sexual assault and war. Those are the classic ones. Oh, you know, yeah. Absolutely. People are watching this with trauma and they're they're going, well, I've never been in a war. Or I've never been sexually assaulted. Well, if you look think... at the stats of how many how many women have experienced sexual mistreatment and, um, One and the amount of men as well, uh, I think the stats are underreported. 
but you know, people have had life-threatening illnesses. They've had car accidents. You grow up in an alcoholic family, you're going to have trauma. I, whether it's that your parent has been um, physically or emotionally abusive or just absent. It's funny because I, I talked with, with a patient yesterday who said, well, um, my mom was alcoholic and she left and my dad was working all the time and I was 12 years old, home alone, and I panic when I'm alone. That to me, that's trauma. Panic attacks. You know, was he himself. physically assaulted? No, he was not physically assaulted. But he had to take care of a younger brother at a young age, and he didn't know how to do it. And the, the, I've heard lots of cases where kids get blamed because they couldn't do things. You know, when they're seven years old, they should have cooked dinner. Um, for people who are sensitive to certain, I'm sensitive to auditory. I can read an email and hear someone screaming at me. Why? I grew up in a very loud, emotionally, uh, let's call it an abusive family. There were other factors that were good, but I had to deal with this because I would react to yelling like somebody else would react to getting hit over the head with a two by four. Well, that, and usually when I email you, I actually am yelling at the computer screen as I write. But you know enough not to put it in capitals, so I won't know it. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, you do want me to answer you, right? If I'm, if I'm paralyzed, I can't answer you. Exactly. Actually, I'm the proof that therapy works. I've done more. I've been the guinea pig for my own technique. Uh, so more than any other human technique being. different from you know the in vogue rapid resolution um technique or, or I, I can't speak or... to that i don't i've never been trained in it but most of the insults are in the body that's why i work with a body therapist even if they're not so now somebody's hold has a gun and they hold you up what do you do <gasps> you telling me that's not the body when people get upset, their heart, there's all kinds of physiological responses. So the, I've worked with several different body therapists. Now I work with Samantha Haynes, who's a lymph specialist. And the, her idea is that the emotion is uh, encoded in the hormones in the lymph. Yeah, I don't check know out that, our podcast where we had her on. That's the right. Podcast, um, right over. I, I've worked with craniosacral people. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a body component to this. And that's what was different when I, when I, that's what I didn't have when I was working with the vets. The, the Navy SEAL that I talked about, his body changed shape, was incredible. But think about it. You're in a, you're in a frightening situation. Perhaps there's a body insult along with that situation. So the car is coming in and you go like this that memory is encoded all through these muscles, okay? Under stress, you're going to replay. It's like a piano with a C chord. There's another piano. C chord is being, it starts to resonate. You will resonate it with experience, which is why we are gonna see people like you and I are gonna be busy for a long time after this uh, pandemic is officially over, if that ever happens. Uh, probably we should have it was over last week remember On well we declared it over but yeah. you know for us it's over maybe not for anybody I live else. in my own world so there you go well me too well I'm in I'm kind of in your world the, the the bottom line here is I've found that without the body therapist we don't get nearly the results because we're we're opening up exit points for this energy now can a person do well just kind of crying? Yeah, I guess so. Well, can I add something here? The neuro, there is a neurophysiologic basis for this. We've talked, I think we talked about this, that that state and the corresponding neurons that activate the muscles that activate changing the shape or defensive or whatever is very basic, you know, first year college level um, neuroscience that sells it fire together they wire together 
And if anything, at any point down the road, the brain doesn't forget, activates that wiring mm -hmm. from a different area, the whole circuit lights up just like it did at the moment. It takes them back to that moment of the original trauma. To me, um, this is one plus one is two, but I, I don't know why you know, I haven't seen other psychotherapists doing this kind of thing. Yeah, there are some psychotherapists who are pretty smart and they say, well, okay, after you see me go down the street and find a, find a massage therapist or somebody or a chiropractor or a physical therapist that knows this kind of work. To me, that's silly, but um, because mind, body, heart, spirit, they all get encoded at the same instant. Um, you know, one of the, we, if we go back to the idea that people who have post-traumatic stress disorder um, don't believe that they're going to have a good outcome, I want to reassure everybody. I've been working at this since 1992, so it's almost... That was before I was born. That's almost 12 years now. No, I, <laughs> it's a long time. People really do get better. Let me get the calculator out on that one. It's a long time. Yeah, yeah. before they changed the air in the water. You before know? I was born. For sure. Before you were born, when you were just a twinkling in your mama's eye. I was 28. I'm 28. Yeah. There you go. Um, Do you want to talk about some of the other trauma therapies and where they came from, the evidence, what they're good for, what they're not, which can make you worse, which cannot... Well, here's the thing, rather than single out any, any particular therapy, if when people have trauma, they don't want to live there. So they push it down. Anything that brings it up and doesn't have an exit point is gonna make them worse. I'll give you an example. There was a guy who was about to, to do a, a, one of these mind body sessions. He's in the waiting room and I come out to get him. And he says, I need to go home, I'm having a panic attack. <laughs> I said, you're in your psychologist's office. What, yeah, better place, what better place to have a panic attack, you know? So I brought him in, he got on the table. Sure enough, it was the energy trying to get out. We did the, the release work. He was smooth. He was sliding like a sled on snow then. So what does that look like? What is the release work? How do, how do, you, how do you explain that to a viewer's potential patients i mean is, is release work like uh cognitive behavioral is it emdr what i don't understand release it, work. look it could be a lot of different things it de it depends on the patient's model of the universe and and sort of what happens as this thing unfolds sometimes i'll use eye movement because the if the patient is open to that because it activates the brain in a different way sometimes we move the body to, to resemble the uh, traumatic experience. Uh, anger is stored in various places of the body. Uh, Samantha does this uh, fantastic Thai, I don't know it's Thai yoga or Thai massage, I don't know what they call it exactly, which will reveal places in the body that are likely to hold the emotion. Is that like Vedic Thai yoga? It mu that must be what it is, I, I don't know the, the term. Um, hypnosis can work under various circumstances, be, if, but it doesn't get to the body component. It'll get to the psychophysiological component sometimes. And look, people need conventional therapy to process what comes up at the deeper levels. Mm -hmm. They want to make sense of it in their lives, but it's not, it doesn't usually get you to the core. And when it does, people will have accessed the psychophysiological state without you encouraging them to go there. Is that what makes EMDR work for some people and not others? Because maybe EMDR is enough to um, break that, that impasse, kind of facilitate the impasse where they're stuck energetically or, um, <clears throat> and, and, it, and then it kind of shuts the rest of the uh, maladapted system down kind of sequentially or someone else, EMDR does nothing because it's really, it was a trauma that started from the body, whether that was a sexual assault, a physical injury, 
and then worked its way kind of energetically up to their their brain, their spinal cord, mind, and then attention. Human beings are creatures of infinite variation. So you get so rather than saying you know one size fits all, I and I don't know the I answer to you. I don't, know. I don't really know the answer to your question about why. And but, I stumped but, the guest then. Well, but I'm going to give you a theory you know, just in, in place of an answer. Please. Let's say a person is, is, is more visually oriented. You, so if you use eye movement, you activate the visual part of the brain, you have a better shot at, at getting how the trauma had been encoded brain-wise. Uh, if they're kinesthetic, you for sure you're gonna want some kind of touch. Uh, auditory may do better with, with them talking about it. The bottom line is people have usually will have all three inner senses. They've usually encoded things all, all three ways, but you want to go with, with what's the, the most powerful stuff. For me, you know, what are we, what are we trying to do? We're trying to keep our body integrity. Somebody assaults that or something assaults that. And it could, by the way, be a life-threatening illness. It doesn't have to be a person. But the treatment of that life-threatening illness and the process of going through it will involve people. That's the, the other thing. And the one thing that I would kind of wind up with, because I know we're running out of time, is people will tend to get to go through trauma interpersonally. And that's why it's hard to get out of it by yourself. I mean, how it gets like, in, it keeps how it gets in is how it has to come out. That doesn't mean you have to be in another plane crash, by the way. It, and and I, I'll give you one last piece that really is a kind of speaks to it. I had a patient who was, she was a very successful businesswoman who all of a sudden couldn't handle flying. Had got a terrible flying phobia. So I went through it carefully with her. What she would freak at, there was a, a move that the planes would make as they would get ready to come for land, they do this and then come down. That's where she freaked. I said, well, what is that? She had been in a car accident where the, the car had flipped, went in the air, and as we processed it, she was able to fly again. That's okay? a, good, a good illustration. And it was, the, it, it was interesting because it, it was the angle had somehow been encoded in her body that she was going to die in that car wreck. And we can go through, she was outside of her body. There's a whole lot of other phenomena that go along with this but they're all trans phenomena. As we, we go back to under conditions of high stress, people will go into, the, into this psychophysiological state, the memory gets encoded in a certain way and you've got to access it if you wanna work with it. And I think that's a good place to, to kind of wrap this up. I do wanna to touch on one more thing, um, medications. Are medications good, bad, helpful, not? Um, once again, no, there's no one size fits all on this. I think that some medications, I think um, benzos are contraindicated for this. But if a person can't function, okay, um, they may need it temporarily. Um, you want to ask me the question? Yeah, are, are medications, while you ask the question, maybe you should answer it. I know, but uh, why don't you answer it? So you, medication. You know, wait a second. This guy's a trauma expert too, by the way, in case you're wondering. No, I'm, I, I drug people for a living. I'm trying to get out of the business, but medications alone cannot cure trauma or PTSD, but it can help a person manage the symptoms such as like anxiety or depression or uh, insomnia. Um, these are kind of sequela from the original injury. And so yes, medications can be a tool for, to assist when you're call, in your quality of life, but they certainly don't cure PTSD. They only work when you take them, and that's if they work um, at all. Uh, but, so that's definitely a conversation for your doctor, but we're here to talk about healing, and our guest today is Dr. Richard Shulman. Disguised as me. Next um, week I'll make be sure your guest host. you oh, check out. I have a book. Mark, Mark read healing. my book. It's available at all fine. Where can you get this thing? Really, Amazon or through me. Office. Yeah, you can come to my office. Amazon or, or Amazon.com will have. It's called the Labyrinth of Healing, the Emotional Shifting Process, 
And actually, we could do a whole other show on substance abuse and trauma, um, which maybe we will do. Um, but yeah, the book details, and, and somebody's on the back cover. Oh, it's, yes, yes. I see. Mark oh, Marshall. yeah, you got a, a glowing review. Dr. Shulman's a skilled and intuitive healer with the gift of unrelenting compassion, insight, and understanding. This work resonates with those navigating the labyrinth of healing. Wow. Wow, that guy uses his uh, tongue prettier than a $20 or oh, no more. Maybe a $100 bill. Anyway, everybody, uh, thanks for watching. And and Mark is Mark Sylvester's on the back of the book, actually. Yeah, those okay. were my words, so I didn't plagiarize. They were very, thank you, Mark. They were beautiful words. Uh, I'm going by Don Quixote today. I please okay. respect my alias. Until next week, until next time. Be, Be well. well. Bye, everybody. Drive through.